CataractCoach.com, podcast number 23 with Stephen Dell. Now, you may know Stephen Dell from his work with ACOS, AECOS, the American European Congress of Ophthalmic Surgery. He's been a former president of this organization, helped to found it many years ago. And it's an organization that's designed to have collaboration among ophthalmologists and as well as with industry people who are helping forge our field develop the instruments and technology that we use to give patients better eyesight. We had a great discussion about things that are important in your future development as a surgeon, but also as an innovator. What makes a meeting great? And what are the best ways to learn? So there's some amazing advice. I know you'll enjoy it. Check it out. So welcome back to our Cataract Coach podcast. Today we're talking with Stephen Dell, who runs a private practice in Austin, Texas but also is a key opinion leader and has been a leader in our field for a long time. He was president of ACOS, the American European College of Ophthalmic Surgery, and has really done a lot with helping younger physicians get into good practices and also work with industry. In fact, my anecdote is back about 15 years ago, I met him in an airport waiting for a plane, and I asked him some advice about the practice situation I was in. It wasn't ideal, and he gave me some sage advice at the time which we'll get into later in the conversation, but I think we'll have a great time. Steve, welcome. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for having me, and uh, I'm happy to be here. Yeah, one thing I really admired about you is you really are a mentor to the younger generations of ophthalmologists. And how did you kind of get into this role, and why is this something that's so important to you? You know, it's a good question. I don't really know. Um, I, I guess that I've always been good at sort of putting myself in the shoes of other people. You know, sure. I kind of I kind of feel like that's been helpful in communicating with patients as well. I you know when I when sure. I'm trying to communicate something to a patient, I sort of think, well, if I were sitting there, what would I want to know about this? Uh, and so when I approach a young physician who's trying to figure out, you know, how do I navigate this crazy world of ophthalmology, uh, particularly as it relates to uh, getting involved in clinical trials, working with industry. You know, I, I always think back, well, how confusing was it for me when I first started and what would I want to know then that I now have the benefit of knowing after all these years of, you know, getting beaten up by the, by the, by the profession. Yeah, you know, I think I can definitely relate to that. We go through these phases of transitions, 30s, kind of 50s, 70s, kind of early career, mid-career, late career. Yeah. And early career, boy, just surprising how naive I was looking back. Uh, you know, it's so funny you, you mentioned key opinion leader. So this is maybe like a, a true confessional. I, I can remember um, being at some kind of an ad board or some sort of a meeting and they, and they were saying, well, you know, the, what do the KOLs have to think about this? You are, you know, the, the KOLs. So let's hear from some of the KOLs. And I sort of looked at the person next to me and I said, what is a KOL? Like I, I, I didn't really know. I yeah. didn't know what the term. I had sure. not. I guess I, you know, I'd been doing it for a while, but I wasn't familiar with the term KOL. I'm thinking like that. O's got to be ophthalmology, you know. So you know, like, you know, and it, and finally somebody kicked me under the table and said it means key opinion leader. And I, you know, I didn't. None. Of, I don't think you or I. We didn't really set out to become key opinion leaders. No. That wasn't really a a thing. Um, I just wanted to be involved in the fun stuff. You know, I. You know, if you think about when you and I started out, there were so many emerging devices, right. so many technologies that were really on the cusp of just. Exploding. I'm talking Presby about. Presby Apple Wells, the thumbnails like later, lasers. Well, even the eczemers. I mean, you yeah. know, when we first started, yeah, sure. all those eczemers, you think about all the eczemers that are out now, they were all investigational devices right. when we first started. Um, or they were on the cusp of having various approvals. So the, you know, the cool kids were all kind of doing clinical trials sure. yeah. for this laser or that IOL or whatever it was. And I wanted to have access to some of that new technology. So it really started out as a desire to, to get involved in clinical trials and studies with all these amazing new technologies. You know, and I was fortunate enough to come up through uh, the New Orleans system where, sure. you know, as you know, the first eczema laser treatments were ever done. Sure. And, and 
just having that experience to the explosion of technology that we sort of assumed would always be the case, but it was really a very special moment in ophthalmology um, in the, I guess, late 90s and early 2000s, early 2000s yeah. where so much of what we take for granted was being developed. Yeah, I think we go through constant evolution in our field, but every so often we have a revolution. That's right. Like an eczema laser was one. I think we're getting there now with maybe presbyopic lenses, hopefully accommodating lenses in the near future. Absolutely. I mean, that, that became pretty quickly, the, you mentioned accommodating lenses, that became sort of a very early focus of my career. And we, we did our best with the technology that we had sure. at the time. But I can remember the moment that somebody first proposed or, or, or explained the nature of a potential accommodating IOL to me, yeah. I thought that was just the coolest thing that I'd ever heard. You know, so we were we were accustomed to dealing with the absolute presbyopia pseudophagia, which is not fun. And the idea that you could actually have an implant lens that would provide accommodation, that was amazing. And yeah, sure. uh, so I knew that I really wanted to be involved in that. And I was somehow able to get myself involved in the early clinical trials for that. And as I saw the results for accommodative IOLs early on, even though they didn't provide as much accommodation as we would have liked or we really needed, we figured out ways to use that technology because it was the only thing available at the time right. that would allow us to provide any sort of accommodation. And that was sort of one of the big launching points for me to become involved in physician education. Yeah, I think one thing to really emphasize there, yes, those accommodating lenses, the crystal lens early on, gave a range, it wasn't full accommodation of three or four diapers, but it certainly was a better range and it kept incredible image quality. But probably the side note that a lot of ophthalmologists don't know in the modern day is, that's also what led to the approval by CMS, Center for Medicare Services, in May of 2005 to allow us to have patients have access to that technology and also pay out of pocket for it. I mean, I, I can't overemphasize the, the importance of the contribution of Andy Corley sure. and the team at originally at Ionix and then, uh, you know, later Bausch and Loam. But I had the opportunity to go to CMS to actually present why we thought there should be the ability for patients to pay on their own for something that was covered on one hand being cataract surgery, but then a component of it being uncovered. Sure. I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that that has saved our profession. Absolutely. I mean, if we did not have that shared billing, uh, I guess, channel where we could spur new innovative development, we could fund research, right. we would not have any of the multifocal IOLs that we have now, we wouldn't have the eat off lenses. We certainly wouldn't see the early stage companies that are now working on next gen accommodating right. IOLs, right. which have the potential to revolutionize what we do in ophthalmology. That whole patient pay category would not exist and we would be practicing essentially internal medicine. You know, we yeah. would be fighting with the government every year for another 3% uh, reduction in our fees, mm -hmm. and it would be a disaster. Yeah, it's a hard to imagine, but yeah, that one thing really revolutionized the way we practice ophthalmology, certainly cataract surgery. Yeah, you know, and, and I think that maybe younger surgeons who didn't live through those, those times uh, as practicing physicians. Don't realize. Yeah, they may take that for granted, but you know, just remember that you stand on the shoulders of giants, right? It was Newton who said that. Yeah, right? sure. And, and it's so true. Yeah, no, for sure. It's uh, also, I always think about the millions and millions of patients who would not have benefited from these technologies had that not happened. Millions. Like you said, there would be no EDF lenses. You wouldn't have all this development of accommodating lenses. Yeah, you know, you, when you think about any new technology category, be it, well, let's take the presbyopia correcting IOL category as a whole. There was criticism early on, well, the accommodating lenses don't provide enough uh, function. Well, yeah, sure, probably the first generation of anything is gonna yeah, be just a little bit 
less terrible than what came before it, but certainly don't judge the entire category on the first generation of, course. of what comes out for any technology. And by the same token, the first multifocal that we had, the first multifocals that we had, not that great. Yeah, in comparison to today, for sure. But it got us thinking about presbyopia. It got us thinking about uh, the mindset of when when we were residents, you you know, you take out a cataract, the goal was not the elimination of spectacles, it was just the elimination of the cataract. But now think of how things have evolved that we take out a cataract, we're automatically thinking, well, what is the best refractive outcome for this patient? Is it, sure. not, do we leave them myopic? Do we give them monovision? Do we attempt to eliminate their uh, distance correction and give them some component of near vision. These are all things that we take for granted now, but those were not even on the table when we started our careers. Right, now we have a full spectrum of refractive options for cataract patients. Yeah, I mean, you know, you could argue that it's an entire subspecialty now within ophthalmology, refractive surgery. And there are people who are trying to develop that as a separate category that maybe we think of ourselves as like oculoplastic surgeons or retinal surgeons, that there's a specific uh, uh, subspecialty uh, certification even for refractive surgery. I don't know if that's the right path or not, but I do know that a refractive mindset is something that you either have or don't have. You know, yeah, and, and I, I think I, you're right. Yeah, you because know, you know you, your colleagues that, that there's some very excellent cataract surgeons who don't really pay attention to the refractive outcomes Outcome. of their patients. It, it's just not their priority, and that's perfectly fine. But for those of us who think in terms of, well, let me see what I can do in terms of achieving spectacle independence for my patients. It's a lot of fun to kind of work through the, the mental problem of, well, this patient sitting in front of me, what's gonna be the best outcome for them? And how do I elicit from them what they want after surgery and then regurgitate back to them a solution that will achieve those results? Right, take into account their needs and desires, their, let's say, refractive state, their anatomy, their biometry, and then come up with a solution that's kind of tailor-made to them. Yeah, and, and even their lifestyle. That kind of gets back to what I started with, where I, I think of myself in the patient's chair. You sure. know, like, well, what would I want coming in here? What, you know, what, my own, you know, it's, it's interesting because my own two eyeballs, me, as a, as a, as a patient, I have natural monovision. I was just sort of born that way. Um, or I evolved that way. I used to have great distance vision, but as I got uh, into my teens and early 20s, I started to develop myopia in my non-dominant eye. So I'm kind of naturally Plano and minus two now. Wow. And I wasn't so thrilled with that when I was 30, but now I love it. <laughs> yeah. You know, That's a gift. It's really a gift. So I very rarely wear any type of correction. Now put in a contact lens to go snow skiing, so in flat light, I want to be able to see the terrain, but that's about it. You know, maybe it's a really nice way to be. Monovision is a, wouldn't you say that it, among ophthalmologists and optometrists, if they have a choice, a lot of them choose it's monovision? very common. Yeah. Yeah, I've done surgery about um, 70 ophthalmologists. 70? 70, a lot. Wow. <laughs> maybe because they're all in LA, but. I don't even know if I know 70 <laughs> ophthalmologists. Most I don't know, personally, but I think I think probably like 50-ish maybe have chosen some degree of monovision. That's it's interesting. Very common. Yeah, that's very interesting. And I bet, do you use the light adjustable lens at all? I actually was in the original, you talk about trials, I was in the original 2009 trial. Yeah, wow. So that's a neat option too, to be able to put that in and then adjust for exactly what the patient wants. It to yeah, I mean, I find that a lot of ophthalmologists and optometrists, they like that idea of the adjustability because, you know, let's face it, we're difficult people, right? You know, we would be difficult patients. I'd be the worst. Yeah, yeah, I, I applaud you for operating on 70 of us lunatics. But it's actually easy, you just tell them, here, what lens do you want, I'll do it for you. And then I do one other thing, I give them a video of their surgery, because I said, I know you're gonna ask me, so here's a video. Yeah, yeah, I, I, you know, when my time comes for cataract surgery, God, that would be nerve wracking, you know? I, you, you're sitting there, you know everything that's happening, every single step, he's like, oh, he's doing the capsule on yeah. me now. Or, you know, that's you know little, too much. That was a pretty aggressive hydro dissection there. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I'd need a fair bit of sedation, I think. Yeah, I think we all would. <laughs> the, the magic of the percent. Exactly.
Yeah. But where do you think we're going with accommodating lens? So I actually was involved with one company, still involved, the Lens Gen uh, Juvene Lens. Mm -hmm. I was lucky enough to do the first implantations on humans in 2015, and now, gosh, eight years later, I suppose we're starting an FDA trial. I mean, I want to see more horses in that race, even. Yeah, accommodation is really hard. Yeah. Um, I started um, at working with two com companies principally, but mostly Bausch & Lomb, early on in developing a, a next generation accommodating IOL, and went through many iterations of designs and implantations outside the US, actually getting to the point where we put in, I think about 55 implant lenses um, of various iterations. Sure. And I can, as you well know, it's really difficult yeah. to achieve the two principal goals in an accommodating eye well. Number one, you have to have refractive predictability that's excellent. You know, if you've got great accommodation, but <laughs> you're, you can't achieve good distance yeah. vision, get, the game's over. Right. Nobody, that's a, that's a dead product. So number one, you've got to achieve very good uh, refractive predictability at the level of our current IOLs because, you know, with monofocals or with EDOF or multifocals, the new generation IOL formulas, the precision with which we can measure the, the, the various biometric parameters of the eye, the recognition of the importance of uh, ocular surface disease treatment before we measure these patients, sure. those have really allowed us to home in very closely on our refractive goals. And so that's become the standard and the bar there has been raised significantly. So if you can't achieve really good distance acuity, it doesn't matter how much accommodation you right. really have. So then the second goal is that you need a degree of sustained accommodation that's much, much higher than we had with the original What do you get magic numbers? Three, four diopters? I think it's about, four, I think you need to have about four diopters of peak accommodation because that probably means you've got two diopters of sustained accommodation. Yeah. And I think that that's an important distinction because if you, in a clinical trial, ask somebody to eke out these five letters on the J1 line and they can just do it, that's very, very different than having Read a whole read, book. Yeah, reading fluency, where somebody right. sits on an airplane with a little light up there and holds a book and can read it. You know, that that's a different animal. So yeah. you need about double the accommodative amplitude at, at a peak that to have a good, sustained, comfortable accommodation. I'm convinced though it's going to happen. I'm, I'm hopeful and hopefully in the next five-ish, 10 years, We'll have a truly common lens, but I think it's a great time to be an ophthalmologist. Yeah, there are a few really good, promising uh, technologies, and some of them we'll discuss at this ACOS meeting here in Deer Valley. We'll, yeah. we'll have those presented, but there, it really is uh, gratifying to see uh, money being invested, time, effort, sure. energy being invested in that space, uh, which, as we mentioned a few minutes ago, would not exist without that shared pay. Uh, a category uh, in ophthalmology. I mean, can you imagine trying to develop these technologies where there was no, uh, there's no economic model that yeah. would allow these companies to be successful? That's just never going to happen. Yeah, it's just so, so crazy how just that one little effect. Thank you, Andy Corley and team. Absolutely. That's such an amazing They deserve impact. all the credit. Yeah. Absolutely. Speaking of ACOS, tell me more about this. You're one of the founding members here for ACOS. And now it's, it's, it's evolved. It's become one of my absolute favorite meetings. I really love this meeting. And it's like, on my, I already got next year's dates and put them on my calendar. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. You know, ACOS is, I guess I was the, the second president. So I, I was the founding president elect of ACOS. Steve Slade was the first president of ACOS. And the, sort of the idea behind this, a lot of the credit goes to David Cox. Um, you know, the idea that we have this siloed uh, you know, we've got the physicians over here in a silo and we've got industry over here in a silo. And David kind of thought, well, there are no products that we use that are not the result of a collaboration between industry and physicians. There's so, never been anything done in ophthalmology that wasn't a collaboration between those two groups. So what if we had a society that actually had members who were leaders in industry and coupled that with members who were leaders in ophthalmology on the physician side and physician and uh, non-physician scientists, right? And so the and that's a very unusual combination. And 
And that's and this society is in fact unique in that regard that we have full fledged members. For example, at this meeting, we have a um, a program committee member, Aaron Powers, who is actively employed in industry and to have uh, that equal footing so that everybody is on the same basis, everybody has the same status within the organization. The leadership consists of industry members and physician members. It's really allowed us to advocate for our specialty with sure. regulatory agencies. It's allowed us to get, uh, in fact, we did the first, uh, we got the first approval for corneal cross-linking as an ACOS sponsored study where we were able to go to FDA and say, listen, we as a society represent uh, industry and physicians. This is a true clinical unmet need. We have patients who are needlessly oh, going sure. to uh, corneal transplantation. And in Europe, those patients are being cross-linked. Right. And that's not happening. So what can we do collectively to help our patients? And so when we have those triple wins, where industry wins, where our patients win and physicians win, that's a really gratifying thing to see. And I, you know, we don't have any designs for ACOS to be a giant organization, but I'd rather it to have the right small number of individuals. Sure. And I kind of feel, and I think you probably feel the same way. I learn more at these ACOS meetings than I do at 10 of the larger meetings. Well, know? one of the reasons I think I love to this meeting is there are no lectures. That's right. Every presentation yeah. is purely a case presentation, yeah, there are no a video. Lectures. It's all about the, and a basic level of understanding is assumed. Yeah, you can blame that on me because I have <laughs> such a short attention span. I just hate sitting through lectures. Yeah. I really do. And, and you know, if you think about the typical lecture you see at one of the larger meetings, the first three, four, five, six slides have to explain that, well, the implant is made out of this material and it's got this diameter and, and here is the A constant for it. Or, you know, they have to explain the basics. It is assumed that that's all known. Yeah. Or if you don't know it, then you go Google it. You, you, know, you, you can go look it up yeah. somewhere. It's not, so we, we use cases as a means of illustrating the true crux of the, of the issue. So for example, we have, if you have a new technology like the IC8, like the Aptera, sure. the IC8, um, we know what it is. We know what it looks like. We know what the pinhole is supposed to be doing. Um, where does that lens really work? So right. I'll present a case later today. Here's a patient where we had a very difficult clinical problem, someone with an extreme degree of irregular astigmatism after RK with a bizarre refraction. How can you use that lens to fix this guy's right eye? Right. So we're talking about his right. We're not talking about the aptera as a, as a, you know, uh, as a, as a product in general. But we're 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 talking about Mr. Blank's right eye. How did we fix him? Yeah, for sure. The case studies are the best, especially because we do get this meeting, a few minutes of the case study, and then a bunch of minutes about the discussion and the debate. Yeah, like ten minutes of just discussion. That right. was that's I think super helpful. Yeah, even for my cataract coach session here at the meeting, uh, I just a few minutes of video, but the videos are no right answer. Like one of them, I'll give you previews. Well, what IOL do you put in this 16-year-old with bilateral 22 on cataracts? Yeah. There's not, not a great answer. Yeah. And so I'm sure the panelists are all going to have differing opinions. Yeah, I mean, that's that's whole, the whole basis of the case presentation model, which is if I'm sitting in the audience, I want to think, well, what would I do here? You know, right. again, putting yourself in the, the other person's chair. What would I do in this situation? I always loved case presentations as sure. an audience member because I could see myself in that surgeon's role. Oh, well, what would I do here? Oh, I wouldn't do that. All right, that <laughs> no, that seems kind of crazy. Or maybe I agree with yeah. that particular solution. You know, so. But sometimes you know, I get convinced though of alternate opinions. Like I used to think, for RK patients, no, I, I just stick with a monofocal lens. Right. And then I saw a case presentation where someone said, no, here, here's where I put an EDOF in. Mm, yeah. And it actually turned out better. And I was like, you know, I'm going to take that advice. Yeah, I think you do see um, conventional wisdom get challenged at this yeah. meeting. And I think that's very helpful because you go up on the podium and you're going to hear, well, this lens is approved to do A, B, and C at mm -hmm. a major meeting. And you can't even really discuss using it outside the lines. These off-label things that we're doing. Absolutely. But 
You know, what I used to learn in the hallways, that's where you really learn. If you go to the, the large meetings, what yeah. you learn in the hallways after you've heard the lecture in the big room, and then you see your buddy out in the hallway and say, well, what do you really do? <laughs> you know, what do you, well, you know, how do you really use this? And that's what a meeting like ACOS is designed to, to be. We take that hallway experience and make that the whole meeting. Yeah, no, it's fantastic. It's done very, very well. I got to commend you guys. The whole committee who puts the meeting on it has become one of my absolute. And I, I do probably twenty meetings a year. Twenty and, meetings a year? Oh, I've already done like four countries this year. I got, uh, I got ten international trips this year, so I'm all over the place. But it's uh, no, it's absolutely one of my my most favorite meetings. Well, you guys done a great job. Now talking about putting yourself in other people's positions. I'll go back to what I said at the very beginning of the intro. So one of the best bits of advice you gave me was back in maybe 2009-ish. And I was uh, in a practice situation that wasn't ideal for me. Yeah. And I kind of picked your brains and asked your advice. And you just said, hey, it's okay to put yourself first. It's okay to just uh, put you and your family first and do what's best for you. And it's okay to change gears. Wow. I mean, that's a really, it's a, such a, a, a daunting task to do something like yeah. that. Um, I don't remember where I was in my career at that time, but um, you know, I started out, I joined a, a couple of doctors out of training and we were literally the three clowns next to Toys R Us. We were in a, in a strip, <laughs> in a strip, like not a strip mall, but like a, you know, a, sh a retail center that yeah. had a professional building yeah. in it. And there was a Toys R Us. I don't know if people, they don't have Toys R Us anymore. No, they right? went bankrupt. Yeah. So um, there's a Toys R Us next to us. And, you know, uh, we grew that practice to about 20 physicians wow. and optometrists over the years through acquisitions and hiring. And that's a very steep growth trajectory. And that became the dominant practice in, in Austin, uh, Texas. And you know, it was, it was sort of impossible to fail um, when the city around you is growing that rap rapidly. As long as you just do reasonably good work, you're probably going to be pretty successful. Uh, and that practice got very large. At some point, I found that what I was gravitating toward were these premium lenses, were these technologies like LASIK. And I found that I was eventually unable to deliver the type of patient experience mm -hmm. that I wanted to a gigantic practice that was a soup to nuts um, multi-location practice with you know lots and lots of employees like sure. a couple hundred employees and so at some point I actually split off and had a, a purely I guess you might even refer to it as a boutique practice sure uh, where really all we do are premium technologies and the patient experience is like staying at this, you know, St. Regis or a Ritz Carlton or a Four Seasons or something like that. And so I want when the patient comes in to the uh, to the office, I want them to feel like, OK, these people seem like they know what they're doing. Again, yeah, putting course. yourself in the, in the position of the patient. Yes. And when they walk into the reception area and they see curated art or they see curated books, something as simple as, you know what, I bet in my patient base, there's a group of people who are really into motorcycles, dogs, cats, World War II memorabilia, uh, you know, contemporary art. I need something for everybody, everybody mm -hmm. to feel at home because if you think about it, because I treat patients for LASIK and I do refractive lens exchange and cataract surgery, those are different patient populations. Sure. Yeah, I need people who are interested in graphic novels, but also, you know, Battle of the Bulge, yeah. right? It's a very different, but you need to make it cool and, uh, you know, professional looking in a way that makes people feel at home, at ease. And then you can have these important conversations with them about, how we're going to fix their vision in a way that makes them have tech, have confidence in the technology, but also in the practice. Sure. I do the same thing. I have a boutique practice and I have only one rule. I give the same level of care that I want to receive. 
Like yeah. you said, put yourself in the patient position. Yeah. That's exactly what I did. I mean, it's like the simplest rule, right? Just, right. you know. I think we learned in kindergarten, right? Right. The golden yeah. rule. Right. It's probably the basis for most of the world's religions. Just treat everybody else like you want to be treated. And, and that's fine. If you just did that, you probably need like one commandment. You know, like just, just that's it. Just be a good person. Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing too is patients sometimes don't realize that this surgery is going to change the way you see the world every waking moment for the rest yeah. of your life. Yeah. I think, if you're going to spend money on anything, spend it on this. That's right. Yeah. I mean, there's a bunch of ways to, to frame that in a discussion. But you could say, yes, you could say, well, what else do you own that you're going to use every waking moment of your life forever? Um, that's a that's a powerful statement statement. Or, you know, you have sometimes you have tech oriented people who come in and say, listen, if you're going to have to watch a TV for the rest of your life, you probably buy <laughs> right? the 8K version. Right. Or, you know, by the time maybe it's 16K or whatever. But you want to buy the very, very best television you can possibly get. Because right. you're stuck with it. Because sometimes patients, and I know you've had the same experience, the patients will say, well, could you upgrade this in a few years if something better comes out? And the answer, as you know, is kind of like, well, probably not. You know, it's tough to do that. I always I say, if you want a lens exchange, I could probably do it, but yeah. the thing of last resort, and just you have to know as the patient, it's going to take a week off of my life. <laughs> yeah. You know, it can be done, but it's not like changing your shirt. You know, it's it's a it's one of those things that we don't do lightly, and it would not be done uh, as a matter of course. Yeah. So going back to like the young physicians, how do you? So if you are a young physician, one of the things I always learned was that your first practice, your first job is like your first girlfriend or boyfriend. They're great and all, mm -hmm. and I know you love them, but you may not be the one you're with forever, and that's okay. It is okay, and in fact, I think the statistics probably bear that out. I think that most people eventually end up in a practice, well, I don't know if that's right. I, you know, I honestly don't want to know what the numbers are, but a good chunk of people that we know sure. are in practice situations that are different than when they first started. For sure. But there are also people who are still with the same practice that yeah. they first joined, and they spend their careers there. And, um, you know, I think it's important as you know, um, it's important to get along with the people that you work with. For sure. You know, it's just not worth it. Let's say you're in a situation where you're making a ton of money and, you know, things are just great financially, but you just hate the people you work with. Oh, it's not, it's not <laughs> worth it. <laughs> you, know, you just can't stand yeah. coming in. It's just not worth it. Yeah. You know, you may take a hit for a year or two or three, making a change, but in the long run, you know, you need to be happy. Well, that's great advice. Yeah, don't exchange your happiness, your peace of mind, your time for money. If you're gonna be miserable, please, okay, let me give you permission, shift gears. You know, and, and, and another corollary to that, and some people, have, some younger physicians have asked me this in the past. They've said, well, I've got this incredible opportunity and I like the practice, I like the people but it is in a location that I really don't want to live in. But I think I got it figured out. I'm going to take Fridays off and I'm going to buy an airplane and I'm going to fly away every weekend and <laughs> I'm going to leave the place that I hate and then I'm going to go to the place that I love. And I think, well, that sounds like a lot of work. Yeah. You know, like why don't you just go and live where you want to live and it'll work itself out. So you can go to you know, the most competitive, you're, you're in an incredibly competitive sure. market. If you want to live in Los Angeles, you'll figure out a way to, to thrive in Los Angeles. If somebody wants to live in Austin, Texas, where we've got a ton of ophthalmologists who've moved in, it's a very competitive market. Someone will figure out a way to, to make it work if they really want to live there. And that's true for wherever your particular desired place to live is. So I, I, my advice always is pick the place you want to live uh, first and foremost. I totally agree with you. And another thing that young ophthalmologists may not realize is the volume of cataract surgery is increasing rapidly in the country. Yeah. While LASIK may be relatively flat, mm -hmm. 20 years ago we were doing less than 2 million cataracts a year. Now we're doing 4 million a year in the U.S. with so double number. But we actually have, we're, we're dwindling number of surgeons. True. More surgeons are trying than we're producing. There are only 460 new ophthalmologists created in America per year. And a lot of them don't want to go back to the days of working 80 hours a week. 
a lot of them want to actually have a lot of work-life balance. Yeah, that's true. Um, you know, we're starting to see, I think, the first cracks in the system in terms of physician shortages. Yeah. Um, I don't know if this is the experience that you've had in LA, but if, if one of your friends calls you and says, hey, could you recommend a pediatric cardiologist for my, my friend's son who needs to get in to see somebody, it's very difficult yeah. to get into almost any surgical subspecialist right now. Mm -hmm. and, and while there are still ophthalmologists out there who would love to have a little bit more cataract surgery, I think most of the people that I know are busier than they've ever been right. and are about as busy as they want to be. Right. Uh, and they're now thinking in terms of, well, how can I sculpt these, let's say I do 15 cases a week, how do I sculpt these 15 so that they're the 15 cases I want to do? Right. You know, that the mix of those cases really becomes the ones that I want to operate on. Um, and I think that you're, absolutely correct that we're unprepared for the coming tsunami of cataract patients. Like, yes. If you think about it in what, in 10 or 15 years, we're going to have to be doing 30, 40% more surgery than we are right now. Easily. We're not ready for that. And yeah. you'll have hopefully the comforting lens. So you'll have these 50 something year olds who are coming in for refractive lens exchange. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I don't have the capacity to do 30% more surgery. I'm not going to do it. So somebody's got to, and if we're not, if we're, if we're net losing ophthalmologists every year, because I know that more retire sure. than, uh, are coming on board, we're going to have to get more creative in how we spend our time. Um, and it's going to be surgical, not, uh, you know, I, I know not, not blood phritis and red eye, not, not sur surgeons will not be doing yeah. that, or at least, uh, a lot of surgeons will not be doing that. I started to see, maybe you've had this experience in uh, Los Angeles, but for the first time ever, we had, we've had problems getting anesthesiologists to cover our cases. It is tough. It's just, it's just been really fascinating. We have a very busy ASC that's, you know, would be a, I guess 10 years ago would have been considered a, a crown jewel, you know, for a, an anesthesia group to come in and have that many cases. The group that we've worked with for decades just recently told us, hey, listen, we really like you guys. You're super efficient. Um, we don't have the manpower to service you anymore. Wow. And we'll be gone in 60 days or whatever it was. Some shockingly short period of time. And we had to scramble to find new coverage. And in fact, it was quite difficult. And I've heard from others that they're uh, they're, they're having the same problems. And I know that there is a looming shortage of anesthesiologists. And that's got to be true in all specialties. Yeah, I met my whole family's doctors. Yeah. And so, yeah, in, on almost every subspecialty, there are absolute shortages. Like you said earlier, pediatric cardiologist, good luck finding one. If you find one, good luck getting an appointment. Yeah. How about a rheumatologist? Because we overlap yeah. with them a little yeah. bit on some of yeah. our dry eye patients. If I tried to get a patient in to see a rheumatologist, uh, you know, it's very difficult. Well, how about even a neuro ophthalmologist? Well, a, a fellow ophthalmologist, a neuro ophthalmologist, impossible to get an appointment the next month. Well, what's what's that? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Your patients with optic neuritis, those guys. Oh yeah, those, those, that's that rope in the back of the eye. It's something like that. Okay. You yeah. got to focus the light real perfectly, and then they they, they take. It I always there. wondered what happened after the the, the lens. <laughs> no, but also, yeah, I think you made another important point, which is okay to evolve your practice over time. You may start off doing everything. When I first went to practice right out of residency, right. I did everything. Everything was, I had a great residency experience where I did a ton of cases. So I did everything from like, in a day I could do a TOSA surgery, I could do a strabismus surgery, I do a bunch of cataracts, PKs, I do a traps, surgery. all that stuff, yeah. And then end the day with some diabetic PRP. Yeah, yeah. It's way easier to, to, to uh, limit than to expand later. You know, you should probably start broad yeah. and then you can, you know, sort of focus in. Uh, it's very difficult in your, in let's say your five or 10 years into practice to try to adopt in a completely new uh, component of your practice where you say, okay, I'm gonna start doing uh, retina injections. You know, it's not that hard to do, um, you know, technically. But the clinical decisions. But the clinical decisions, yeah. you just haven't been in that mindset for a while. So it's a lot easier to, to, to you know, focus down and edit than to, to expand later.
No, that's absolute. Yeah. And I think especially when you're first out of training, gosh, your knowledge base is amazing. Yeah. Like I know if you're in your first year or two of practice, you still know what A pattern and B pattern for business is. Don't ask someone who's been doing cataracts only for about 50 years. Yeah. <laughs> they don't uh, even know. Yeah, so, we're diagnosing a fourth nerve palsy. You're kind of it's just, we're showing off to... But the three-step test. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, you still remember that, you know. You know, can, you remember studying for the OCAP Yeah, quiz? for sure. Yeah, the OCAP quiz we take every year, you know. You, somewhere, it's back there. The, the knowledge is still there. And if you can figure out how to access, access it, it. Yeah, yeah. yeah, hopefully that hard drive is not frozen up. But also important that even as we narrow our focus, we have to still keep learning. So just, I mean, think the way you do surgery today is not the way you did it 10 years ago, certainly not the way you did it 20 years ago. And even when we did our training, there was no femtosecond laser. There right. were no Exmer, well, Exmer laser barely coming just on the barely, market. Yep. There was no um, lamellar coronary transplantation. There was no OCT machine. There was no anti-VEGF treatment. Yeah, yeah, it's, you know, we have lived through, you know, and I, I kind of feel like we're in the golden age of ophthalmology right now, if you yeah. think about it, you know, everybody, you know, I, I will never forget this because when I first went to one of the major national meetings, I was sitting, having a cup of coffee, and I just come out of the lecture, like the main lecture hall where they were talking about fee cuts and, mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're going to be, uh, and cataract surgery's gone from this much to this much, and it's going to go down to this much. And, and I came out of that auditorium thinking like, Gosh, I feel like I've signed on to be a, you know, uh, like a farmer, like the American, you know, or something like the, uh, some, at the time, you know, like the American farm seemed like it was yeah. dying. And I, I, you know, I felt like I had, this is a terrible, what, what's, what's going on here? And next to me happened to be sitting, I don't even know who he was, but some older ophthalmologist. And he said, you have no idea how great things are right now. It used to, yes, we used to get $3,000 an eye for cataract surgery, but it used to take 30 minutes to do, or 40 minutes to do cataract surgery. Now you can do it in 10 minutes or 15 minutes, and one day you'll be able to do it in five minutes. And things are gonna be fantastic. And, and I have no idea who that doctor was, but that little brief interaction over a cup of coffee outside of a, a, a conference, you know, a big meeting room, is very impactful. and it's turned out to be very, very true. Uh, that, and right now, if you think about it, the golden age of ophthalmology, we have the ability to have presbyopia correcting IOLs. Our laser vision correction options are phenomenal. Yeah. You know, you wonder why LVC volumes are kind of flat when we can very reliably produce better than 2020 vision sure. in so many of our patients. Uh, we have the ability to treat glaucoma in a way that yeah. we certainly didn't. Uh, years the whole ago. big spectrum, for sure. Yeah, I mean, when when I was a baby ophthalmologist, you know, pilocarpine QID was kind of normal, mm -hmm. or uh, beta blocker. Those didn't really do all that great of a job and made patients feel kind of lousy. And for sure. and think about the mix options that we have now that didn't exist. Um, in almost every component of our specialty, things are way better. Uh, ARMD, think about the, you know, what do you do for ARMD back in the, when we first started? Macular translocation surgery. Photodynamic therapy, or you yeah. know, they just laser the macula and hope that it's somewhat less horrible than it was mm -hmm. before. Yeah, I mean, we have a whole slew of technological innovations that have allowed us to practice in a way that is so different than 20, 25 years ago. Yeah, and then the, the correlator is it's gonna keep progressing. So for the young ophthalmologists, do not worry. I encourage my own kids, this ophthalmologist is an amazing thing. I am thankful every day to be an ophthalmologist. It's a blessing, absolute blessing. Yeah, I mean, you know, you've been so involved in, in physician education over the years, and sometimes you hear griping from a resident or a fellow, and <laughs> you know, you, you have to pull them aside and say, listen, you know, the no offense to any internists, but the you know, the worst day in ophthalmology is better than the best day in internal medicine. <laughs> and that's, I really believe that. And I always, every day I go to work and I kind of feel like this is, this is so incredible. We're using these amazing lasers and this incredible technology and our, our surgeries are quick and the recovery is yeah. so 
fast and the outcomes are great and patients come up to you in restaurants and say, Dr. Devgan, you, you, yeah. you changed my life. And, you know, I don't think people, you know, the oncologists don't get that. You know, they, you know, sure. it's 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 just a very different type of, uh, you know, kind of uh, of specialty, and we're privileged to be in it. I've got a funny story for you. Once, when my kids, when they're mid teenage years, you know, where they're embarrassed of their own dad, yeah, and we're at Costco together, right? And this woman runs up and says, "Doctor Tefkin, thank you. You're the best." And she tells my kids, "Do you know how great your dad is? Your dad, I was almost blind. Now I have perfect vision. All thanks to your dad. Your dad's the best." And my kids are like. Him? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that woman would like, but yeah, you're right. You can go, you, I can go to places like Costco, yeah. and patients will recognize me and come up to me and say thank you. Yeah, and your kids are like awkward. <laughs> <laughs> you know? yeah. But I think it really, yeah, now we're so fortunate. It's, it's an amazing field here. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And uh, you know, it, it's taxing, you know, it's hard work. Yeah. It requires you know, a lot of, you have to do a lot of things right. You know, you think about it to be a successful ophthalmologist, how many things, how many different categories of, of tasks do you need to be good at? You need to understand uh, optical physics. Yeah. You gotta be good with your hands. Really good with micro hands, yeah. micro, micro procedures. Yeah, you gotta be really good with your hands. You've got to have, you, you know, probably the most important thing is know when not to operate. Surgical judgment. Yeah, know when not to, when to stop. Yeah. You know, as you, you train, doctors and you know what's the most important word in, in in surgery when you're coaching another surgeon stop yeah. stop right don't do that anymore right. stop yeah let's stop let's take a breath and let's see where we are and then let's make a plan because you know your surgeon the, the tendency is to oh i can fix this let me go 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 deeper 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 no that's deep enough stop digging <laughs> yeah you're, you're, once you get a certain depth stop digging yeah you've you've struck oil <laughs> yeah no it's, yeah there's actually a ton of important lessons did you guys that's that's only one of them but yeah you said earlier surgical judgment that's a tough one too yeah knowing when not to because you go in, in residency you're just about operating anyone needs surgery i'll do the surgery let's do it that's right when not to that's really important and you know that ten thousand hours Malcolm Gladwell thing. I think that's real. You know, you, yeah. You know, I used to uh, when you came out. You were an excellent surgeon. Uh, I thought I was a good surgeon in the first five years. Thought mm -hmm. I was pretty good, and then you realize, oh, there's a whole other level here, and, and then you realize, oh, wow, there's a whole other room of levels here that you didn't even really know about, right. and and that's what's. That's what's rewarding about our career is that you just keep getting better and better and better. Maybe it's like golf. You know, golf is the simplest sport in the world. Yeah. Put this ball in that hole using that stick. It's <laughs> it's a it's a one sentence instruction. Right. But there are probably people who spend their lives perfecting that, and they get better and better and better in ways that don't appear immediately obvious. Yeah, like on camera coach, I say camera surgery takes years to learn but a lifetime to master. Well, that's a great quote, honestly, because I think that yeah. kind of sums it up very nicely, um, that it is it is relatively easy to be a journeyman cataract surgeon. Sure. Relatively, relative, I say relatively sure. easy, still pretty hard. But to to get to your level, I mean, that's that's something else. And you really have to, to uh, refine your craft and think of yourself as an artist, not, not as a journeyman. Not Correct. as like not as a technician. Yeah, I'm not. I'm, this is not an assembly line. I'm not just cranking these out. I want each one of these to be uh, as as good as I can possibly make it. Yeah, and keep learning. That's the best part too. I was in this, the Brazilian cataractic meeting uh, about six eight weeks ago, and was had their live surgery event. Wow, such incredible surgeons! And I even met a, a surgeon. I thought high volume was okay. Let's do a few thousand here a, a year. I met a surgeon who does more than ten thousand cataracts a year. Like he's done, a, he's done two hundred and eighty thousand cataracts. Wow! And his skill it's is a, just unbelievable. It's a good sized city. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's an amazing setup. But yeah, it just it's we got to keep learning and keep evolving it over time. And and that's the beauty why why I did cataract coach just five minutes a day. I'll show you something very interesting, very new every day, and uh, you'll pick something up because like you, I've got a short attention span. Well, you know. I, I congratulate you because I, I don't know, you must 
receive feedback on how broadly that has impacted our specialty. Sure. But there are there are so many surgeons who use that resource as a way of, uh, you know, oh, I've got a case, I haven't done one of these in a year. Let me see what's on Cataract Coach and I can just refresh a couple of things in my mind about uh, pointers that I want to keep, you know, at, at, in the forefront of my of my thinking um, when I do this case. And it's been a really wonderful resource and I congratulate you. I mean, it's got to be a, a labor of love. You must sure. love it because it's got to take so much time. It do. takes a ton of time, but uh, yeah, I, I absolutely love it. And it's, uh, it's something that I actually learn more than I contribute. I get yeah. so many videos. I get sent five to ten videos a day. I watch them all. Wow. So even that takes yeah. time. But it's helpful now that I'm an empty nester. My kids are growing up out of the house, and so I get more time. Yeah, and you mentioned earlier about doing research and and being involved in in new technologies. Sure. That forces you to stay at the forefront. Yeah. It forces you to to up your game, because people call you up and they say, "Hey, I have a question about this technology." better be prepared for those questions. Or if right. you're training other surgeons, you, yeah, you, you, you'd think, well, that's a good question. I better, I better know the answer to that. And um, I think that that keeps it interesting, but it also keeps us current. For sure, and I think, I encourage all the young doctors, I really enjoy the many, many years I've worked with industry, mm -hmm. because you really get to dictate the future of our specialty. And you had some very important pros that if you are gonna work with industry, which is, which I, I love what you said, Industry has their goals and yeah. your goals though are different. Yeah, that's right. Can you elaborate on that? That's right. So, I mean, you know, you think about the, the, our colleagues who work in industry, they've got their products. These products are like their children. Yeah. You know, literally they, their job is to, to uh, grow these products. That is, that is what their purpose in, in this industry is. Um, we have a slightly different role. We don't work for industry, we work with industry, we work for our patients. Correct. Uh, and so if there are aspects of a particular technology that you're being asked to speak about that you think are not quite what they should be, um, I would encourage uh, emerging leaders in ophthalmology, go ahead and speak out. Say, yeah. hey, listen, I, I use this particular technology in situations A, B, and C, but in D, E, and F, it, it's, a, it's actually not the right choice. I don't like the way it performs in that situation. And sometimes I find surgeons are, are reluctant to say things like that mm -hmm. from the podium because they think, oh, well, they won't, the company won't, doesn't want me to speak on their behalf in the future or I won't get the next clinical trial. That's nonsense. The companies want to know that you are an honest dealer, that you're a broker of, of, uh, of, 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 I guess the best way to put it would be uh, uh, reliable information. Sure, and a broker you, of truth. Yeah, and that you're credible, that yeah. you're a credible uh, speaker, and that you're gonna tell your audience the way things really are. I always loved, I had a, you, you knew Lenor Dan. Oh, for sure, fantastic guy. And, and what an incredible role model he was because he would always tell you the truth about a product, yeah. even if he was, the mouthpiece of that. He was the product champion sure. of that particular uh, device or whatever it was. He would say, listen, this is really nice to have, but you don't need it. Oh, you yeah. know, I mean, that was that was Lee for you, that yeah. he would say, it's great, but you could, there are workarounds, or you know what, it's phenomenal, but I would wait for the next generation. So he, I always admired that uh, independent, uh, thought and that and that truthful, uh, honest broker, uh, you know, uh, way that he conducted himself. Absolutely, he was an absolute straight shooter. He yeah. said, gave me some valuable advice. He says, "It'll take you five years to build credibility. Mm -hmm. It'll take you five minutes to lose it." Yeah, well, I mean that's that's very true. That's a brilliant advice. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, be true to yourself. Be true to your patients. I think you can't go wrong. And in take on projects in, in industry that you actually enjoy, that you actually have an interest yeah. in. Yeah. Like, I don't want to be involved in the F FDA trials and dry stuff. I just don't, it's just not me. Yeah. Yeah, and you shouldn't be doing it then. Right. And, and and by the same token, I think it's useful to work with more than one company. Oh, that's great advice, absolutely. Yeah, yeah because if you get sort of perceived as, oh, 
big surprise, Dr. Such and Such likes the product from this company. Mm -hmm. I've noticed that she always works with that company, exclusively works with that company. I think maybe she works for that company, you know, like that can be, that's a problem. You really do lose credibility. You sure. need to, you need to work with the best products in every you know category of what you practice. All right, if you work for just one company exclusively across the board, you may have a conflict of interest. Yeah. If you work for many companies, it's hard to have a conflict of interest. Yeah, it, it is highly unlikely that any given company has the very best product in every single category. Oh, for sure. Right? I mean, sure. that would be a, you know, I, you, you're into uh, riding bicycles, right? Sure. Okay. Mountain bikes. Right. Mountain I'm not bikes. very good. You're not, okay. Well, but I enjoy it. Yeah, but it's probably the case that, um, you know, the very best uh, manufacturer of brakes doesn't also make the very best tires. Right. You know, or something like that. You know, there's probably some amalgamation of the very best components yeah. that you can put together for, for, sure. for, uh, for biking, which I don't know much yeah, about. Yeah, but sure. uh, the same thing is true in ophthalmology. You know? Yeah. Uh, and at a very high level, it's probably uh, a little bit from this company, a little bit from that company. And, and that allows us to work for our patients. So you're a young doc starting a practice, you got a job you think for right now it's pretty good for you, you're happy mm -hmm. in the location you want. You want to be more involved with working with all these companies or participating in, you know, on, on the podium or on a panel. How do you, what's your first step? How do you get involved? You know, it's surprisingly easy. You know, it, re it really is. And, and here's what you do. Um, let's say you have a product that you really like and you think, wow, I would really like to get involved in the next generation of this product or... I want to expand the use of this product. Tell your local rep, hey, I really like this product. Mm -hmm. I want to get more involved. Because those reps are the, the first point of contact for all of these companies. And that rep will then say, they will send an email that day to their supervisor saying, hey, I met this young surgeon, very promising surgeon. Um, they really like our technology. I think we need to get them involved, involved in a regional, uh, you know, uh, speaker program for our for our technology, and then that will get kicked up the chain to the next person above that. Mm -hmm. And before you know it, you'll be on an advisory board, or right. you will be asked uh, to provide your input on a particular product, and you'll be meeting with higher and higher level people at that company because those companies are actively seeking out who are the next generation of surgeons, who are the surgeons yeah. who like our products, who are interested in this space. And you can very, very quickly, I've seen this so many times, very, very quickly get involved at a high level uh, with these companies. So that's what I would recommend. The very first step is to uh, find a technology that you like, tell your local rep that you do like it and what you like about it and that you want to get involved. Yeah, you know, I did the same thing many, 20 years ago. It's kind of how I got my step, my foot in the door there. And yeah, they brought me on and said, okay, well, we're going to, we're actually developing the next iteration of this. Advise us. Yeah. It blew my mind. Yeah. I mean, because think of the market research for them. They, yeah. You know, this is their actual customer. Right. Telling them, hey, could you please next year, uh, make the tires a little wider yeah. or a little narrower or whatever right. it is. And, and this, this is what they want to hear. They're, you are the person they want to hear from. Uh, and you'd be surprised. You think, oh, I'm just a young doctor. I'm only in practice for a year. They don't know who I am. They want to hear from you. They yeah. really do. Yeah, for sure. I'm going to wrap this up and end with one important thing, which is how do you see your practice transitioning as you get older? And then what are the differences between, let's say, being an ophthalmologist in your 30s, kind of early career, 50s, mid-career where we are now, and then what do you think is going to be, let's say, 70s, late career? Well, yeah. I mean, you kind of touched on some of this earlier, but when you're in your 30s, it's just like all comers. Just, yeah. you know, I want everything. And then you start sculpting. You start saying, okay, I really just want to see this type of surgical problem. Um, and I'm really not going to... I'm certainly not going to practice medical ophthalmology, ophthalmology um, because they just don't have the bandwidth to do that. Sure. Uh, and so you you first get yourself full surgically, 
And then you start sculpting the nature of that surgery so that it is the type of surgery that you really want to do. And then I guess maybe if you sort of look way into the future, ophthalmology is one of those specialties that you can kind of practice half time, I think. All right. You know, there you can't be a half time neurosurgeon, I don't think. No, because you have to be married to the hospital, remember? <laughs> yeah, you have to be, yeah, they're going to want you there. and At least 80 hours a week. Yeah, something like that. So, But, you know, you could, and we certainly know people who do this, you could practice like a couple days a week or maybe sure. less where you operate a day and maybe you have a two half days of clinic. Mm -hmm. And you could just sort of loaf along doing that for a really long time. I do think, and I know that you've been an advocate for this, you got to keep yourself physically active. Sure. You know, I don't think you can be a surgical athlete unless you're doing something else athletically yeah. in your life. And, it, you know, whether that's walking or triathlons or whatever it is, you got to keep yourself physically active sure. because, you know, we are essentially very uh, skilled um, uh, laborers. Yeah. You know, For sure. chop off our hands and our surgical volume is going to go way down. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, you, you got to, we're, we're essentially uh, piecemeal workers. Right. And it may be that, you know, one time somebody said, well, what do you do? I was like, well, I'm real, I'm really like a microscopic underwater demolition expert, you know, cause I'm just, you think about it, you know, I'm just, right. I'm just, just, I'm destroying these cataracts, de demolishing them, <laughs> removing them. And then I'm, replacing them within a space of a fraction of a season yeah you know if i go up a millimeter too high total disaster if i go down a millimeter too low total disaster you know <laughs> and, and so it's uh so but you can sort of um if you keep yourself physically active uh you can practice gosh i think kobe Kraft's father when he retired from surgery he was like the oldest surgeon on the planet period oh, man. In, in, yeah in any specialty yeah you know no one could find an older surgeon wow you know i'm not sure that's the distinction that i want to go for but i think you could easily continue practicing very high level ophthalmology if you keep yourself mentally and physically fit into your 70s well sure. into your 70s i mean you know i've seen it done and you know there's probably a few in their early 80s who can uh, who can who can do this so I think that we're very fortunate that our specialty allows that. Yeah, and I think especially if you said, if you find you've sculpted your practice down to things you just really love. Yeah. Like I could see myself maybe in the future whittling it down to just like, all right, I want to do just these IOL surgeries, maybe even stop doing LASIK or other, yeah. other chiropractic. And yeah. Just find my real true passion. Yeah, I, you have that luxury when you get to the stage of your career when you can actually do that. Um, but. You know, I, I think that that's, that's in, in the future. I think we're, we're all lucky to be off the mall. I just want to thank you for participating in this podcast. I had a fantastic discussion. And as for my audience, remember, we have a new podcast every single week and more great learning coming up. Thanks again, Steve. Thank you for having me. Thank you for watching that podcast with Stephen Dell. I'm sure you learned as much as I did and really enjoyed that in-depth conversation. Remember, we've got a new podcast every single week. And you can get these podcasts on Apple, Amazon, Spotify, Google, and where you find your podcasts, plus it's on cataractcoach.com, and you can watch the video of it on YouTube. We'll see you next week.